catch them up somehow, or they can just jump in with what's going on. Just jump right in. Just yeah. jump, just yep. Just feet first. That's, yeah. that's exactly right. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for coming today for our nature and history lecture series. This is the third one I think we've done this year now. Yep. And um, so, um, I'm Yvette, I'm the site supervisor here, so on behalf of the National, National Park Service, I <laughs> just have it, um, of the State Historical Society of North Dakota, um, we'd like to welcome you. Um, and so our speaker today is Ben Jordan, and as you can see, he's going to be talking about Fort Buford and the Weather Telegraph. Um, so I am going to turn it over to Ben now. Oh, thank you. Oh, so. well, like she said, my name is Ben Jordan. And I portray a signal service officer in the 1870 station out here at Fort Beaver. Brief history of the signal service in the U.S. It was established in 1860 by Albert J. Meyer, uh, who's uh, Meyer, uh, he was very influential in the Signal service, he uh, was father of it, but he came up with uh, signal flags that you see on one of the table there with the red square in it for messaging using by semaphore other troops across the field. And the signal service was later authorized by Congress as a separate branch to the Army in 1863, as we know in Civil War. They use signal flags and telegraph to communi communicate over distances. So you can see there in the flow there, signaling using a signal flag, there would be a series of ones and twos, the left being left being one and the right being a two. And that's how you spell out your you know, attack, Fort Sumter or whatever else. And right here, this is um, they're setting up a telegraph. This is a telegraph station, mobile telegraph station, and they're setting up wire across the field. You can see the fighters in the back. And the Army's use of the telegraph becomes the sole responsibility of the signal service in 1867 as known as the U.S. Military Telegraph. So all the lines that were run by the U.S. government. They were U.S. military telegraph lines. Congress mandated that the signal service uh, track and predict the weather in 1870. The reason they did that was so that they could track weather patterns as they were affecting navigation along the oceans and also the rivers. The telegraph arrives at Fort Buford in October 1878 from Bismarck. That's when the line arrived here. And the office itself began operation in early 1879, the following year. So Colonel William B. Hazen, who's actually in charge of the 6th Infantry Regiment out here, he became uh, Chief Signal Officer in 1881 following the mayor's death. So he, he was stationed at signal officer at Fort Buford. You see we have two maps. The map on the left, that is Fort Buford the way it looked in 1874. And the one on the right is the way it looked in 1893. And here. Right here, it's not built yet, but it's right there. And it's right over here in the, this map, the winter map. So we're waiting for it to be built. Although, of course, they didn't know that, but the rivers being, and the confluence being a major interstate system of the time, that was basically the only means of transportation, reliable transportation, I should say. And then here's a photograph of Fort Buford, it was right around 1880 or so. And it's in there. 
go ahead and find the seat. But it, it's in there. So uh, well, right over here, this is the field officer's quarters. At that time, it was commanding officer's quarters. It's still out there today. And this building here was the adjutant's office. Other than that, it looks like all, all kinds of different buildings. Big hint as to where it is. That one right there. That there. Is the uh, weather vane, just like I have reproduced there. It's the only thing that could be. There's nothing else that it could be. So we're very fortunate that we have this picture. And they kept records then, did they? They did. They did. But photographs are hard to find. <coughs> the telegraph is due to labor for his duties at Fort Buford. Was sent and received, received messages over the wire, which you can see this gentleman doing here. He's probably, that picture is probably from the 1880s, based on his dress. Maintain the office weather and telegraph instruments, which you can see many of right there on the table. Repair and maintain the line wire, which is the wire that's up on the ground means you had to climb poles if you had a Maori Indian or a soldier that shot low insulated you had to repair, repair that and there was about 60 miles of that was of wire that was in this charge you also had to do daily weather observations this building here that this is sit on top of is probably in Washington D.C. because where else would you have that many guys showing off what they're doing. Oh, yeah. uh, this is an instrument shelter. You would have many of those instruments like your barometer and the thermometers inside here. A lot of these are actually still used today. Very similar form. So you can see the wind vane with the anemometer and the cups. Shows you your wind speed. You have a rain gauge here as well. This guy is letting off a weather balloon track how fast the wind's going up, further up in the air. The military telegraph network, this shows a map from 1885, Fort Buford is right here, and three times a day they had a, they had, out here at Buford they had a, the telegrapher's job was also as weatherman. He had to record the weather three times a day, and they would be sent by wire to Washington, D.C. But it wasn't just him. It was everyone else, too. And they wanted it on a, at a timely manner. So they collected from basically Washington, Oregon, and it would go down the wire, the same wire that would have been out here. Fast forward to Buford, and then we would go to Bismarck. They would be compiled there from all the other stations that were within this one circuit. So I'd be listening to what the weather was in Walla Walla, Washington, not caring as much in the world, because I had other things to do, wishing people would get off the line, because I have messages that Colonel Hayden <laughs> wants me to send out, too. <clears throat> and also my, my weather forecast as well. That got compiled at Bismarck, and then from Bismarck sent on another circuit for, to probably Chicago or um, uh, Baltimore, and then further on down to Washington, D.C. Three times a day, they tie, tied up the wires. And that was system wide. Across the nation, they tied up the telegraph wire. Well, Ben, your line from Bismarck down, goes down to Pierre, or what did it go to? Now this, this map is showing the U.S. military telegraph lines. It doesn't show the, the Western Union lines, which would have been the other major line system. Oh. It would have been a tangled web up here. You wouldn't be able to see what's going on there. I see. But this is all just one circuit that the military telegraph owned. Wow. Yeah, off 
the structure, the one that would have been looking down the fourth piece of here, would look something like this. It was a structure, a simple structure, 36 feet by 17 feet. And you can see it in that photograph. I have reproduced here the, the drawings on the wall. So it would be really great. It would be an asset to Fort Buford if we could have that out here again. And it was just a simple office. You would have had your living quarters for the guy here. There was only one state uh, signal service officer stationed out here. And you had your office where you have your telegraph machine and, you, and your all your supply. That would have been all in this building right here. It's hard to see, but it's there. It just blends in with everything else. Um, so other than that, that's pretty much all I have. Um, thank you for coming. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm here, here to answer them. You know, that's kind of the problem with it. I've researched so much, I don't know what I don't know. So, but I know what I do know. Well, it showed two different, a Y going west of Fort Buford. Two, what was the next two places or next? Well, from from Buford, west. It would have been uh, west, uh, I believe, Poplar River Camp. And then you had Fort Assiniboine near present day Havard, Montana. And just continued further west, following the trails. Like 1804, that was the only cattle trail. We kept following that. In southwest, the one goes, the one line from Fort Buford. Down to Fort Sully? No, that's southeast. Okay. And then there's Deadwood down here. <coughs> Deadwood? Fort Keo. Fort Keo. The map's hard to read because it's, it's basically a copy of the map in. This book. This is a report of the Chief Signal Officer of the War Department, 1878. That's where that map came from. And basically, it's a weather almanac from what happened the previous year. And it has all kinds of maps like this just weather maps. I mean, if you looked at, if you pay attention to the weather when they're giving the forecast today, everything's pretty much the same. There's a direct lineage from um, the work that the signal service was doing here and uh, NOAA today, the National Weather Service. Well, when did they start going west and southwest of Fort Buford with the telegraph? About almost the next year? Or? Yeah, that actually would have been about the next year. They would have arrived here, 1878, like I said, mm -hmm. and then they would have kept on going as much as they could during the our season. It's just like today. It's, yeah. You have two seasons, winter and road construction. <laughs> but yeah, it would have over here you don't see it because this is all commercial lines. They didn't need to have military telegraph. Sure. But Chicago, it would have been a tangled web, just like today with the railroad out there. There'd be so so much there you couldn't see any detail. But that telegraph is about to the west coast, is it? Yep, it reached out all the way out there. Wow. Yeah. Mm. And of course, the first one to arrive out there would have been actually uh, the Transcontinental Line. They would have ran right around where the Union Pacific ran their line out. Telegraph arrived first because it's easier to get a wire out there than two rails on the One wire. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. So their signal officers are these <clears throat> excuse me, are these commissioned officers then that are filling this role then? Yes. So they, they would have been trained at uh, first it was known as Fort Whipple. You know, after uh, Meyer's death it was known as Fort Meyer. It's near Washington. In a suburb. I don't know where exactly in Pennsylvania. But um, they were trained usually as um, sergeants, they would move out there because they'd be a, a sergeant stationed ideally at every post. 
out here we're only in private little station wagons and that's what you want to have. So gotcha. On my uniform, I have the signal service branch, not Chevron, but Icon here. Oh. And you would have gotten received one for when you were proficient in signal flag, and then the other when you were proficient in tele telegraphy. Oh. Gotcha. Just like today, soldiers. Ben, would you also wear a lieutenant bar or stripes? You would if you were one, but pretty much the highest uh, signal service officer would have been a short sergeant. They had lieutenants, but they were only the five of them for the whole whole group of about 100 or so. So below the flags, you would wear a sergeant stripe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what you and the telegraph man lived in that house then? Yep. All the time? Because that was his duty from morning to evening. And uh, research, he probably didn't even cook because he would have had no time to do it. No. Uh, the 1881 uh, report of the chief signal officer was made out by Hazen, which is really funny because, and he's telling about how there was an infection, 1880, of the Buford office. And he was, the operator was found delinquent in his weather forecasting duties because he was taking priority to his telegraphy work. And it's like, you know, maybe you're the reason why. Hazen was well known for not liking an operator. He thought this is the great American desert. A lot of people thought it been at that time. And he was looking to get uh, more political appointments in Washington, D.C. So he was well known not to like, like it out here. And he would be messaging, trying to get that position. And who else is going to actually do the writing but the telegraphy? And when he's busy doing that, he can't be outside uh, swinging the wet and dry thermometer out around the Seattle Union. It's a little bit too much work. That's what I was trying to demonstrate by this other thing. This screen's busy for her. <laughs> he was a busy man, especially when you have to go and fix it, fix it the wall, line wall. That's a time consuming job. The greenish insulator, probably. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The one that's on the pin over here, broken, that actually was found here at Fort Buford. That's original, and this is what it would have looked like before it was broken. Was the humidity gauge invented yet? Yeah, they had uh, the relative humidity, which is this item here. Well, that right. helped them then, didn't it? Yeah, the wet bulb and the dry bulb. And you smell it around in the air. The temperature difference would show you basically the relative humidity. And uh, also would help for your uh, your let's see, temperature. What what you feel? How cold it feels your uh, dew point? No, not your dew point. But during the winter time. Uh, wind, wind, chill. Chill. wind chill. Wind chill. Were they starting to figure out whether, like, from if the telegraph man west, you know, 50 miles or 100 miles, said, hey, this is the storm, or this, we just got cold. Or, would they figure out that the west winds bring it this way? Did they start? Well, that's out? one of the okay. things that they were trying to do. Oh. As Hazen was trying to get out of here, he'd be in <laughs> constant contact with Fort Assiniboine. As he's yeah. seeing as, like, Okay, we got a storm here. When did you get a storm over there? And apparently, true, they got so much to a point that the Western Union or anybody else that was on the on the wire was trying to tell us, like, "Hey, get off the line. We're trying to talk." Because as long as you're you're typing here, if I can demonstrate right now. Like 
rolling air. Nobody else can talk because they're busy tying up the circuit. Mm -hmm. The only way you can you can is you open the circuit. Then it allows you to talk. But it only allows you to talk when they they close their circuit. You mean send signals because it wasn't a telephone. Yes. yes. But did you you said this was military one? Why was Western Union tied into it? It was. Oh. It was in that feed. Oh, I see. Western Union lines um, were rented out to the government. Because there's this is a big area that would have been Western Union. Yeah, right. And everyone that actually was a telegraph operator was also a Western Union operator as well. Oh, both. Yeah. Because they they basically had a monopoly on the telegraph system. Because it was all their wires that they were using, except for these few here connecting places that didn't have a connection. Right. Well, from here, could they get a message to Washington, D.C.? They could, yeah. They did on a daily basis with the Free Times Daily Weather Report. Is that weather? Oh. But, like I was saying, there's a separate circuit, meaning that you had a single wire going from Fort Buford, actually Bismarck, all the way out to the West Coast. And that, yeah, you only have one wire because the ground is served as your second wire. Oh, sure. And that's one circuit right here. So that means if somebody's talking, you can't talk, but you can listen because your sound there is in the person who's going off the air. Tell us what some of the messages said. said. Such as for weather? Well, not just weather. What are some other messages? That well, it pretty much, you, you name it, they probably would have said it. Versus talking the gossip that, that happened. Because you can, as you were listening to, it, if you were practiced at it, you could really type away real fast. Um, there's really no example message that I have. Okay. But, you know, any, any kind of message you would like, you can send it over the wire. How would you know they were talking to you? Well, before they sent the message, they have, they have a pre prefix to the message. And here you had a station identifier. Let's say you're listening to KFYR on, on the radio. It's the same exact thing. You have a station identifier that, like, this is AB station on one of the, talk to FB station, FB being Fort Buford station. So you'd be just listening to that. Or if you had couldn't be there for a second, that recorder, that brass box there with the paper tape on it, you'd have that go and you'd record the dots and dashes going over the wire that way. For how long would that record for? About 10 minutes, so enough for you to use the bathroom. Oh, okay. So they, had, they probably would have had a... And then you reuse that? You didn't have to change it, did you? Yep, it's just clockwork. You didn't have to change it. Okay. You'd have to resupply the paper once in a while, but that's yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. <coughs> <coughs> Any other questions? Who all did the signal officer report to, Ben? He would have reported directly to Fort Whipple, Fort Meyer, Lindley. That, that was his immediate supervisor. Gotcha. So he didn't really report to Fort the Buford's commanding officer, although he would have been tasked with sending his messages back and forth. So yeah, it was he was a very busy man. Gotcha. And he may have had one repairman that was, you know, taken from the company's station here to help him out because he would have needed needed help for repairing a down wire or something like that. But other than that, that's pretty much it. So he there just would have been one guy, yeah. mainly? Yeah. Um, there were other stations, of course, in more popular.
particularly in areas where you would have had the three or four guys actually doing the work, but they were doing that for, for a photo op. They weren't doing it that <laughs> in real life every day. Usually just one person doing it. Well, if someone was promoted, like, say, let's say to Lieutenant Colonel, would that notice come? Um, uh, promote Jackson yeah, up to Lieutenant Colonel. He could have, but more than likely a lot of the messages that were sent, just based on the desertion rate, oh. it's like, hey, look for this t particular guy. Is he's wearing his um, field blouse and his um, rogans that have a hole in the left foot. You <laughs> might want to, you might want to pick that guy up because he deserted from us two sure. weeks ago. But more than likely, you're never going to find him. No, but at least the search was out. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, if you deserted, you were kind of running on borrowed time. I'd say a lot of them probably didn't make it, but that's my my opinion and knowing how bad things were out, out at that time because there was no one, there was nobody around here. There's, we're about 400 miles from civilization. You're not going to make it on your own too, yeah. too well that way. Poplar was the next one kind of going west and then southwest was another one. Uh, yeah. You'd say Deadwood South. And yeah, and Poplar would have been just basically a, repair station. Oh. We would have had a couple guys stationed out there to work on the wire if it broke or something like that. The main station from here would have been Fort Assiniboine for the west. Oh, okay. Haver, you think? Yeah. In the event that a repair needed to be done, Ben, was it just the, the signal officer or his, his assistant, or did they send a group with them, depending on what the situation was? sent a group with them from Fort Buford just to protect them like woodcutters or any, any other job like that. Because one deal about the wire is that um, Indians regard it as um, kind of mystical, I guess you could say, because when they went up and touched it, at least early on, they'd get a little zing if there was actually a live wire. And it's like, this is pretty good magic, so we better put on our rifle and make it shoot straight. So a lot of the time where you have wire wrapped around a Indian stock, that's why. Oh. Especially if it's iron wire. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because that is, would have been all iron wire. Copper or iron? Iron. Iron. Okay. Iron's cheap. Copper's expensive. Oh, that's right. That, that was more for telephone, wasn't it? Uh, even telephone, it would have been cheaper to use iron wire. Oh. <laughs> um, it essentially the same as what uh, electric fence wire is today. Oh, yeah. Right. When I run my wire out, out there for demonstration, it's it's actually electric fence wire. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any other questions? Ben, on the, um, the building, uh, did you mention that there's a metal plate in the ground? I did not, because I don't know if it's there. Oh. It probably was would not have been there because you only would have had that there if it was an end of the line station, and that be the ground for the the telegraph machine to make a complete circuit. They they might have had something so that you could test the wire, and that was what it used for. But it didn't necessarily have to be a plate; it could have been just a stake, like we see in this other photo or the engraving at rather. Wagon here has all your telegraph instruments there, and we have a ground stake laid off the back. And that's usable, of course. Yeah, they would have had a telegraph station in there. They probably would have had, like in the glass jar, that's uh, gravity for the cell battery. That's one one cell of the battery. The battery would have been about 600 volts. Uh, oh, wow. Each cell made one. And solution of copper sulfate with a uh, copper.
copper cathode down at the bottom and the zinc anode up on top. Is that what powered the whole thing? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, of course, they would have had all the generators out in bigger cities, but this was the simplest way to power the line. And that would do it, huh? How yeah. many? One, one cell here would have powered the station. The internal uh, devices that he actually used. See, you have you're dealing with low power. Yeah. The line voltage would have actually been, by the time it got out here, pretty weak. They need special instruments strong enough just to catch the the signal coming in. They'd have a relay between that and the in the office equipment, so you could actually hear the thing. Well, this was in the line for about one year until they got going to Poplar. Or? Oh, they they were the wire was being continuously built, so they the wire arrived and then it kept on going. It didn't stop. But the next station wasn't always up till they got there, of course. Yeah. So you put in one winter here without the, it. Yeah, the station here wasn't in operation until the following year. Oh, that's all. Yeah. yeah. Right. But they are actually doing power with that. They had that figured out. So. Yep. Works just like a lead acid battery, just different chemicals. Mm -hmm. All you need is essentially a pressure differential for the electron. Yeah. Now, they didn't know that, of course, at the time. But they just knew that this worked. And why should we? But they could get the signal from Bismarck to here, huh? They could. Yeah. 200 miles or whatever about. Yeah. Hmm. Any more questions? Then you were civilized here. You got a telegraph. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's when civilization, civilization finally arrived here. It was within grass. It didn't actually arrive on. <laughs> no, but it was. It <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very. It was basically like when you for internet first came out. It was a pretty big deal. Because prior to that, you had to send a letter, and it might not get there. With telegraph, at least you could hear the other person talk at the same time. Pretty much instantaneous. You could hear the chat. You could hear the chat. Yep, just like we had earlier. Was there any lead time when, when you were? It'd be like today. It's roughly, if you're going across the nation, it's roughly six seconds. Oh. But um, the would have been a little longer because they had the mechanical relays that would have relayed the in information. When I say a circuit, that's like you think of a, your car's battery circuit. That's a circuit, but within that, there's relays, because if you had 600 volts of DC current trying to push, and they actually had this happen. In 1858, they laid first uh, uh, the telegraph wire across the Atlantic Ocean, and yeah. it worked for about a week, and then, they, then it stopped working. That's basically because they fried the wire trying to push so much current through it, trying to get it working. Oh. Yeah. And they got it going again, didn't they? They laid other wires and even more since. <laughs> the first one after that that was actually successful was in 1866 wow. from England to uh, Canada. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But uh, prior to that, any kind of message out was by letter and you'd be waiting two months for it to arrive wherever you were sending it to. If it got there. And you got it here in 1870? Is that the year? 1878. 1879. Yeah. And you said you crossed the Atlantic in 1858. The first yeah. time. The first time they did, yeah. <laughs> Push too much power. <laughs> yep. Yeah. D the reason why we have AC power lines is because DC would, um, it takes so much current to push the energy one way, whereas AC is just going back and forth like this. Six but Europe has DC, don't they? Um, I don't know. But the, all I 
think, had DC on. Edison, Thomas Edison's push was to use DC current. Oh, Versus Tesla's was AC. Tesla, Tesla. Yeah, AC. And Tesla eventually went out. Right. One out. One out. Yeah. Did we do the right thing by doing AC? I think so. It's a lot, um, like you said, you, AC can carry a whole lot more power than what we do. Any more questions? Okay, well I encourage you to take a look at everything and I can take the roof off the building so you can look inside of it. So um, go ahead and look at all everything and any more questions just go ahead and ask, okay? You had barometer for barometric pressure. Did yep. you by that time? Yep, there's one right there. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Again, well, thank you for attending. Um, so that thank you from the State Historical Society of North Dakota um, and the site here at the Confluence Center. So thank you for your time and um, putting the program on for us. There will be another nature and history lecture series um, program in May. But I apologize, I don't have someone lined up yet. So, but there will be one in May and I'll get that word out and who it is um, uh, as soon as that kind of falls into place. There's a lot going on, so appreciate it. On a Sunday? So, it'll be on a Sunday, yep. Yeah. The History and Nature, I keep reversing them. History and Nature lecture series will always be on a Sunday. We try to do it the first Sunday of the month, but that doesn't always fall into place. So depending upon the presenter's availability, it might be the second or the third, so. Yeah, so we'll get that out there and put word out and, and such. So, yeah, so again, thank you. Um, there's refreshments, coffee. Um, please help yourself. So, 